We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So this talk is about uh, combinatoriality in the evolution of human language. Uh, and the big problem in talking about the, and researching the evolution of human language is finding relevant evidence. One thing we know for sure, we can't go back and reconstruct some ori original language of all humanity by tracing back uh, today's languages. So we have to look for other sources of evidence. And uh, today I'm going to focus on languages that have uh, originated much more recently. The sign languages that are used in communities of deaf people and communities of deaf and hearing people. Um, first, the idea of combinatoriality. What's the difference between sounds and words? Well, here's some simple three-letter words of English. We see in this, uh, in this data that words are not holistic, that there's a combinatorial system that combines meaningless speech sounds yielding words with different meanings. Now, uh, there was an interesting discovery way back in the 18th century by a French priest, the Abbé de la Paix in, in uh, Paris. He discovered that the deaf people in Paris, much to his surprise, already had a language of their own in which they could discuss any subject. And uh, that was the beginning of, uh, rec uh, of recognition of sign languages as a human uh, means of communication. American Sign Language, similarly, it, it's indigenous to the deaf community here. It's a mature sign language that has uh, been evolving for about 200 years and one of many structurally different and mutually unintelligible uh, sign language, completely uh, independent of English. And most importantly, it has been shown to have all the key properties of spoken languages except speech. A second and pivotal discovery came along in a book by William Stokey in 1960. Uh, it, it has to do with really what is the central, um, central point of my talk today, which concerns the difference between gestures and signs. And he discovered that like the words of spoken languages, the signs of American Sign Language, ASL, are not holistic, that there is a combinatorial system that combines meaningless parts into meaningful signs. So I'll just show you a few of what these are. 
One component of science is hand shape. So this means change. If I change the hand shape from this to this, it means translate. If I change it uh, to, um, to this, it means interpret. So hand shape is one of the components of signs. A second is place of articulation. So this means bird. This means print. And this means 20. So uh, same hand shape, same movement, different places of articulation at the edge of the lip or uh, on the other hand or in neutral space before the signer. And finally, this mean, uh, movement is relevant. Uh, this means name. This means short. This means knife. And this means egg. OK. All like so. Uh, so it's a combi combinatorial system, phonological, uh, for spoken languages refers to the sound. The same term is used for sign languages. There's an inventory of hand shapes, places of articulation and movements. These are combined in different ways to form different signs with different meanings. And each sign consists of these components, hand shape, place of articulation, and movement. And uh, there's also a, a fourth orientation, but I won't get into that today. So now we know what the difference is between signs and gestures. Signs, but not gestures, result from a combinatorial system that takes these elements and combines them to produce different signs with different uh, meanings. So here is a bird again. Uh, how do we know whether it is a sign or a gesture? And uh, what characterizes it as a sign is it has these components, the hand shape and the L shape, movement, the index touches the thumb twice, and place of articulation is at the edge of the lip. The hand shape and movement exist in other signs, like I said before, 20, or print, or publish. And um, the edge of the lip is used in other signs as place of articulation, like drink or famous. Okay. So the gestural hypothesis is that uh, what were originally gestures evolved over time into signs in a combinatorial sign system, uh, each with its phonological representation, which is, simply means the saying what the hand shape is, what the movement, and uh, what the place of articulation. Uh, important question, what would cause a gestural communication system to evolve into a combinatorial sign system? And the hypothesis I want to present today, uh, there are two things that would drive such an evolution. The first is you get clearer articulation. Because once you know you've got these three components, each of which has, in other signs, a life of its own, that limits how the signer can articulate the sign. And second, that it makes it possible for the relation between a sign's form and its meaning to be completely arbitrary, as in spoken languages. This is a huge advantage because it makes possible a vast increase in vocabulary size, so that, in principle, there can be a sign for any meaning. So those are the two things that I'm proposing uh, drive the evolution from gestures to signs. Now, uh, we, as I said, we can't go back to some original human language. But we can observe, in a few rare cases, 
the birth of a brand new <coughs> manual communication system. One such is Asaid Bedouin, in the Asaid Bedouin community in southern Israel, uh, studied by Sandler, Aronoff, Meir, and Padden. And this is in a small, isolated Bedouin community where uh, recently uh, there's been uh, widespread uh, deafness in the community. The spoken language is Arabic, and the deaf people are using this new system, and many of the hearing people as well, because they have family and siblings and so on who are deaf. And uh, the, th this study started with the second generation of signers. So that is as close to the origin of languages as one can get. And it's been uh, developing there with no contact with any other sign language. And what this team of researchers <laughs> found is that these people are, by the criteria I've already laid out, are using gestures, not signs. That their words are holistic, not combinatorial. So consequently, they being not combinatorial, you, they, the sign, the, the each, which I should really call a gesture, the, each gesture is not analyzable into the parts as they are as such as the uh, signs of, of sign languages are. So uh, there is a way uh, that we can use this to uh, test some of our, our predictions. Since a sign cannot be characterized in terms of this is its, its uh, hand shape, this is its movement, this is its place of articulation, then uh, there's nothing to constrain the articulation. And what these researchers found was that, in fact, the articulation is all over the place. Not just like uh, limited differences, as you find in older languages, like some people say economics and some people say economics. Now, these are all over the place, hardly recognizable in many cases. And uh, there, there are big differences in pronunciation from uh, one family to another. And uh, the, uh, it's not as clear about, uh, I have no real data on the size of the vocabulary, but uh, it's pretty clear that with this kind of total uh, all over the place articulation, it can't, uh, it can't be very big, but I would hold that in abeyance. Certainly, the prediction of, of the proposal I made that, uh, that getting an, a combinatorial system constrains articulation, that comes out very nicely. And the, the next thing I want to mention about the difference between gestures and, and signs is uh, there was a lot of publicity for a long time about uh, chimpanzees supposedly learning sign language and the gardeners in fact signed with their chimps for many years and so on. Rivas, 2005, studied 22 hours of videotapes, eliminated imitations of what a caregiver had signed in the previous five seconds, and these are the results of these four chimpanzees. The first number is a uh, number of different so-called signs. I'm claiming they were not signs, but gestures. And that 58, that the, the four most frequent gestures by Washo accounted for 58% of his total production. For Moja, uh, the four most frequent accounted for 45%. Tatu, 46%, Dar, 41%. So uh, my conclusion is, especially if you compare with the very large vocabularies of children learning a, a, a spoken language, uh, conclusion, the chimpanzees learn no signs at all, just a small set of holistic gestures. 
Combinatoriality is widespread in language. There's combinatorial morphology that combines meaningful units, uh, words, terms, prefixes, suffixes into complex words. So we get complex words like un, deny, abul, eti. And combinatorial syntax combines words into phrases and sentences. Combinatorial semantics combines the meanings of smaller parts of sentences, of words into phrases, phrases into sentences. And uh, consequently, combinatoriality co characterizes human language at every level. We're a combinatorial species. Thank you. So it has been a privilege to be part of CARTA for the last 10 years, and for the 10 years before that, the La Jolla Group for Explaining the Origin of Humans. Over those years, I've been extremely impressed with Ajit's leadership. He has really been an uh, ideal uh, leader for this group as it's grown. And I've also been impressed with his uh, modesty, that whenever uh, you know, someone would praise him uh, on occasion, he would say, no, no, it's uh, my team, my loyal team, really, that uh, is responsible. And uh, of course, he's right, it does take a village. But I think his leadership was absolutely essential. Now, what we've already heard so much about uh, the uh, differences between uh, brains of uh, squirrel, monkey, macaque, ch chimpanzee, and human, and the, the fact that uh, you know there are so many differences uh, that it's really hard to know where to start. But uh, if you look at the different levels of investigation. Uh, starting at the bottom here, uh, from the molecular level, we've seen differences in genes, for example. Uh, the, the, from uh, Evan's talk, we've heard from Katerina differences in the so shapes and sizes of neurons and how they're organized in maps. And, and you know, there, there really are, where do you start to look for these uh, essential differences like language, which is species specific? Now, most of what we know about how neurons represent the world has come from recordings from single neurons as shown here. This is a Golgi stain and that's a microelectrode which is uh, picking up a signal. And back in the 1960s, we already knew from the work of Hubel and Weasel that uh, if you look for this visual stimulus that was the, provided uh, that neuron with the, with the highest response, that uh, th there were a bunch of cells, he ca they called simple cells, that were oriented, that is to say, would respond best to a bar of light or an edge. And furthermore, at every location in the visual field, there were different neurons that represented different orientations. Well, that was a taste of what happened. This is an, ex <laughs> an experiment that launched a thousand microelectrodes into every part of the cortex. And so we, we have a, a, a pretty good understanding now of the different response properties in all those 183 areas. But the question is, how do they compute? And this is a, a question that Pat Churchland and I, who will be speaking later, uh, took on in a book that was published over 25 years ago. This is the uh, second anniversary edition. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very different computing style compared to a digital computer. A digital computer is uh, one instruction at a time. The brain works on all, in parallel. All the neurons are working all the time. Uh, in a digital computer, each transistor is connected to a few others. A typical neuron is connected to thousands of others. So this is really a different style of computing. And what we concluded, and this is from work that was done uh, in the 80s on neural network models, what we concluded is that uh, there is a population principle here. We have to understand how do many neurons together uh, represent the complexity of the world and the combinatoriality that we heard from David. Now I want to go way back. This is my way back machine. Uh, and this is, of, in that era in the 80s, this is one of the, I would say, biggest, <laughs> more complex networks. Uh, had about 200 model neurons, very simple models, integrate the input, uh, the synapses that connected them, uh, had a variable strength or weight. And, and, and there were three layers. There was one at the bottom that represented the words. In this case, that was text to speech. And 
the output was the phoneme. So the idea was for every letter in the middle here of the C to associate it with the correct phoneme, the hard C, the K and cat. And uh, it's a very difficult problem. English is very irregular. There are a lot of rules. You know, when the, there's an E at the end of a, of a word, it's a hard vowel like gave, brave. But there are exceptions like have behaves irregularly. <laughs> and so uh, this is a, a project, summary project for, uh, from uh, Charlie Rosenberg, who was a student of George Miller, a very famous linguist. And this is one of the very, you know, very first uh, attempts to put language into a network. So I'm gonna, there's a learning process, and this is really what the magic sauce, is the fact that there's a way to change the weights sequentially. If, if the output is incorrect, you then take that difference, which, you know, what, what, the, what was the uh, correct output, compare it from the teacher, and then fiddle with all the weights. And I won't go into any of the details because this has now become a high art, and uh, there's much better ways of doing it. Okay, so. Here we go, I'm gonna play what the output look, sounds like during the very beginning. And the first thing it picks up is the difference between vowels and consonants, and you will hear this. Okay, so it kind of babbles. <laughs> and that's the first order of property. But we left it on overnight. It got better and better and better. And now I'm going to play what it sounded like the next morning on a piece of text. We, we trained it on a dictionary and a piece of text here. It's never seen before. So let's see what it sounds like. We know I'm like in gun or something. When we walk home from school, I walk home with two friends and sometimes we can't run home from school now. Because well, this, it was, this was stunning. <laughs> it's, it spoke for itself. <laughs> But, uh, but what's surprising you know, to, to us was, uh, in retrospect, is how small this network was by comparison with today's networks that have not hundreds of units, but millions of units. And, uh, and, and for the experts, uh, what was surprising is that the best work being done in phonology at the time was rule-based, which is to write down a bunch of rules for all that I already gave you, the you know, final E. There are thousands of these rules. In fact, there's a book that we got from the library that had 250 pages of rules and exceptions and rules for the exceptions and so forth and because it's a very uh, heterogeneous language. Okay, fast forward. Now this is like 30 years later and we now have networks, as I said, that are uh, you know, much, much uh, larger but the, 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 the feature that makes them really powerful is not the number of units but how they're organized in an architecture. Now this particular architecture is the most uh, successful of all the networks that have been developed. It's called the convolutional neural network. And you will remember the simple cells that I told you about that Hubel Weasel described. Uh, well, those simple cells do mathematically what's called a convolution. It's if you take the filter and you move it across the visual field, one neuron for each location. Okay, well, in, in this particular convolutional neural network, that was hardwired. The, the fact that you're going to have the same weights over the entire visual field, that saves a lot of weights. You only have to learn the convolutional weights once. But there are many, many layers. It's in a hierarchy. You know, in this case, uh, there were probably about 12 layers uh, in the early uh, days. Now there's like 200. But, uh, but in any case, 12 is about what you see in the human cortex in terms of the hierarchy of visual areas that you saw in some of the previous slides. Now, there was a lot of other things he put in here. And he only kept them if they actually improved performance. But he ended up putting in complex cells, which are also found by Hubel and Weasel. Uh, he also uh, gained normalization for each of the filters. Uh, and then the nonlinearity. A, 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 neurons have a threshold below which there is no output. So you put all that in and, and it improved it, got it better and better and better. And finally, uh, it reached the point where it was outperforming humans on very large data sets, on very large problems. And I'm gonna give you a few examples, but just to give you a sense for what was happening over, you might say, why did it take 30 years, right? Well, the reason is that when we started in the 80s, computers were very weak compared to today's, and it was very costly. 
uh, it, was, it was cheaper to program them. But now that turned over in 2012. It, computing power is incredibly more powerful by factors of you know, millions. And it's cross, so it's now, it's easier to get, collect big data and to train a network on any problem than it is to write a program, which is, has to be a different program for every problem. Very costly. Okay, well here's the result of a, that uh, convolutional neural network that was published in uh, the Neural Information Processing Systems uh, Conference, annual conference. Uh, this was about uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, this was the first indication that this was going to actually have an impact on the real world. If we just look at the top left, uh, you'll see that the confidence in the top five words is indicated by the length of the bar. It gets might right, it gets the container ship right, the motor scooter right, and leopard right. Now, in the bottom left, you know, uh, the label, the human label is grill, but, you know, this is a convertible. The grill is just a part of it. In fact, this is, uh, it, it's an, uh, the, the net said it was agaric, and in fact, it turned out that that is the subtype of mushroom. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's actually smarter than the human. And is that, you know, you see cherry, I see a Dalmatian. And finally, uh, the last one is uh, mislabeled as a cat. It's not a cat, it's a ringtailed lemur. And so, it was, uh, the, that category was not in the database. Uh, and so it thought it was a monkey. So here we go. It's doing pretty well. Now, just labeling things doesn't mean that it understands what it's seeing, right? That, this is just a feed-forward network. Uh, so the, the next question is, can you train a network to describe what's in the image? So for example, here's an image on the left, and it looks like it's a, a market, and you know, it's just a lot of uh, the things that are being sold, and here is a, here is a possible uh, label uh, or a caption, a group of people shopping at an indoor market. How did it create that label? Well, it passed the labels up to a recurrent network that has feedback and has attention that was put in, something we also know is important for our brains. And here we go on the bottom here, a woman is throwing a Frisbee, and you see Frisbee is highlighted in the park. A dog is standing on a hardwood floor, dog highlighted, a stop sign highlighted. So this is really crazy. How could, it's correct syntax. There's no syntax box in this network. Somehow it had learned from examples. And I'll give you now an insight into how it solved these problems. Uh, so first, this is an even simpler network whose job was simply to predict the next word in a sentence. It was trained on millions and millions of articles, you know, just newspaper articles. And now what you can do is, for every word, if there's 100,000 units in this particular network, for every word, the activity pattern in those 100,000 neurons is a vector in this 100,000 dimensional space. And now you could do cluster analysis. And what you discover is that all of the country names are clustered in one little piece of the space. All of the capitals are clustered in another part of space. But what's even more remarkable, I mean, this is a semantic representation in that network. What's even more remarkable is that if you connect the vector from Portugal to Lisbon, that's, that's an arrow. And if you lift that arrow up to Italy, it points to Rome. And, 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 and in other words, there's it's relationships, not just uh, you know, words, but how the words are related to each other. Now, I'm not going to go into the details except to say that this has also been used for temporal problems like language translation. And you can have an app now in your pocket, your smartphone, that will take pictures in one language and translate it into another uh, using this, in case, Google Translate. When you analyze that network, it's even more uh, rich and astonishing. For example, look at that cluster of red points. Each of the points is you know, one of the words in the sentence. And, and this was a network that was trained to do translation from English to Korean and English to Japanese and back. And what you can see is that the three languages outlined in color here are in the same part of the space, but slightly different tracks. And so that means that there's the, the meaning. The, the meaning of the sentence is being clustered. Now, to really see whether or not uh, there is <laughs> generalization going on here, 
It was never trained on Korean to Japanese or back. The question is, without doing any further training, how well does it do? It gets it correct. It translates between two languages. It's never been told how to do the correspondence. And the only way I can explain this is that somewhere the network has created a new language within the hidden layer. There may, in this case, there were like 20 of them. And by the way, also, uh, it was absolutely essential to put in uh, <clears throat> Uh, working memory, which is important because there's long-range dependencies in, in these uh, sentences. So the last word may be important for the first word coming out in the new language. So the, is there an interlingua? Is there something inside the network that is telling us something fundamental about the nature of language? And that this is all just unfolding really fast. And if you're interested, I have a book. <laughs> it just came out last October. But it tells this story in much greater detail, both about the history, the past, where we are now. There's dozens of learning algorithms. The brain has been an incredibly important inspiration. And then finally, where is this heading in terms of the applications, impact on science? Uh, it's, it's really an exciting time to be alive. And I'm going to end with an uh, even more exciting thing that's happening in neuroscience. So we have tools now that allow us to record from thousands and thousands of neurons simultaneously using optical techniques. And this is an experiment that was done by Ralph Greenspan, by Sophie Amon, who then worked in my lab to analyze the data because there's terabytes of data. It's possible with a light field microscope to record from all the neurons in the fruit fly brain at the same time while it's behaving. And uh, I won't go into the details except that a lot of things that are known about fly brains can actually be seen in the activity patterns that I'm about to show you. So the fly, as you can see, is walking. And if you, the brain's on the right, looking down at it. That, that's a protocerebral bridge in the middle that sometimes goes on. It's grooming, a different set of neurons goes on. And this is really a miracle. I mean, I never would have thought in my lifetime that something, you could look into a brain of an animal while it's behaving and see all the neurons as they flash up. Uh, you're, but now, this is uh, the Chinese curse. May you get what you wish for. <laughs> because now we've got to make sense of it. That's the challenge. And, and to the rescue comes machine learning and, and deep learning. So this is really a collision between these two areas. So I just want to thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Comparative medicine has a long and strong tradition at UC San Diego going back to one of the godfathers of the field, Kurt Bernischka, who was actually one of the founding members of CARTA. But comparative medicine tends to focus on similarities in diseases between different species. But when it comes to anthropogeny, we are more interested in differences between humans and our closely related cousins, the great apes. So my own interest in this area began uh, in studies of sialic acid biology, which covers the surface of every cell in the body, in which we discovered a gene that was inactivated two to three million years ago in the human lineage, changing all the cells in our body in many different ways. But that's a different story. That got me interested in human origins and then raised the question, given my medical background, are they human-specific diseases? And what would be the criteria for such diseases? They should be very common in humans, but rarely reported in closely related species such as great apes, even in captivity. And they could not be experimentally reproduced in such species in the days when such studies were allowed. The caveat is that reliable information is limited to data on a few thousand great apes in captivity, mostly chimpanzees. But these chimpanzees were cared for in NIH-funded facilities with full veterinary care and thorough necropsis is death. So they have very good records on these uh, chimpanzees. So my work in this area could not have been possible without my spouse and long-term collaborator, Nissi Varki, a comparative pathologist who actually trained with Kurt. And over the years, we have visited several of these primate centers and tried to learn about human chimpanzee diseases, done some work in the lab, and published papers such as these. And updated to today, we have this long list of candidates for these human-specific diseases divided into definite, probable, and possible, only some of which I can comment on uh, with some focus on our own work. 
Perhaps the most dramatic difference is in heart disease. When I first went to visit the Yerkes Primate Center, I asked the veterinarians, what's the commonest cause of death? In chimpanzees, they said heart attacks and heart failure. I said, oh, that's just like humans. And Nissi went later and said, no, you didn't look at the pathology. It's a different disease. And it turns out that heart disease is common in humans and chimpanzees, but is caused by very different pathological processes. So the process you're familiar with in humans is called myocardial infarction. Coronary thrombosis blocks the blood vessels and, uh, to, in the coronaries and causes loss of heart muscle. In the chimpanzees, what they, and all the other great apes actually, it turns out they get massive scarring of the, of the, of the heart muscle. And that's what they really die of. So actually the commonest cause of human death, uh, in fact, probably going to be the commonest cause of death of people in this room, unfortunately, uh, does not occur in chimpanzees, great apes, or any other animal that we can come across except in very contrived experimental situations. So this is actually not new. It's just we, wa we wondered why this was not reported. And it turns out the reason is that chimpanzees were placed in captivity by NIH as models for human diseases. So whenever things are similar, you find a lot of reports. Whenever they're different, they didn't say much about it. But in fact, the veterinarians are very familiar with this problem. And since then, there's been this uh, formation of this uh, Great Ape Heart Project, which tries to address this issue. And there are two mysteries. Why do we not suffer from this fibrotic heart disease, which is clearly present in the common ancestor of great apes? And conversely, why, they, why do they not get the disease that we get? So this is ongoing work, and we and others are doing. Another classic human-specific disease is malignant malaria, plasmodium pus falciparum. Horrible studies done in the 20s and 40s where there were two-way cross-transfusions between chimps and humans infected or non-infected with malaria. No evidence of cross-infection. And the conclusion was, well, the parasites look the same under the microscope, they are different. An updated view of this is something that Pascal Gagneau and I summarized from the work of many people. It appears that there are many common uh, mild malarias occurring in great apes in Africa which are not transmissible to humans because they bind the non-human sialic acid. That may be one of the reasons. And perhaps when we lost this target, we had a free ride from malaria for a million years or so. That's, of course, speculation, but the parasites always win in the end. <laughs> and a single transfer from a gorilla to a human at some point, probably 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, came in with a, with a parasite that is now binding the human-rich sialic acid. And then, of course, we spread across the world and took the mosquitoes with us and expanded their base and so on, and the rest is, is malignant malaria. Another classic example is typhoid fever. Again, horrible studies done in the 1960s, large doses of s typhi did not give severe or complicated forms of typhoid fever in chimpanzees, and the bug didn't survive a long time in the chimpanzees and they're much less sensitive to the typhoid toxin. The toxin is the secret. So if, as my collaborator Jorge Galan likes to say, if any of you get a garden variety salmonella from contaminated dairy products, you think you're going to die. If you get typhoid fever, you are going to die. It's in fact a very high mortality untreated. And the reason is that there's this very potent toxin produced only by this one strain of S. typhi that infects humans, and it has adapted itself to humans. And a summary of a lot of work with other collaborators suggests that what's happening is this toxin has become highly specialized in seeing the human cell surface and doesn't react very well with the ape cell surface. Another dramatic example is cholera, one of the most deadly diseases that afflicts, uh, still afflicts many populations. Many of you are probably familiar with Robert Koch's postulates for microbial diseases. Microbes should be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from that disease, should be isolated from that organism grown in pure culture, should then cause the disease when reintroduced into a healthy organism, and should be re-isolated and shown to be identical to the original agent. Robert Koch had one failure to fulfill his postulates. In 1884, he complained. Although these experiments were constantly repeated with material from fresh cholera cases, our mice remained healthy. 
We then made experiments on monkeys, cats, poultry, dogs, various other animals, never able to arrive at anything in animals similar to the cholera process. And to date, cholera does not cause diarrhea in any adult animals. There are a few uh, unusual models of baby rabbits models, but basically no other animal. And we don't know the final answer, but again, uh, this sialic acid difference being studied, we've recently published suggesting that this is one of the major reasons and the various mechanisms I won't go into. Gonorrhea. Sexually transmitted disease, 100 million new cases a year, one third of multidrug resistance, high frequency of asymptomatic infection in females, causes pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility, no occurrence in other species in nature, Early disease model in chimpanzees in the days when that was allowed was not successful. We now have molecular evidence, we and others, that human factor H is selectively bound by the gonorrhea organism, not the chimpanzee. And we are studying human innate immune receptors that are engaged by human siglex uh, and not by chimpanzee siglex on the gonorrhea organism. Again, this is a very recent publication if you're interested. Again, I'm not suggesting we found the answers, but we found some of the components of the answers. In the probable category, perhaps the most fascinating is carcinomas. To date, no captive great apes have been reported to have spontaneous carcinomas of the esophagus, lung, stomach, pancreas, colon, uterus, ovary, or prostate. A few liver cancers are switched with experimental chronic active hepatitis in chimpanzees in the days when that was allowed. So Nissi and I looked into this literature, contacted various primate centers again, and wrote about the apparent rarity of epithelial cancers. And we conclude that while this relative risk is a likely difference between humans and chimpanzees and possibly other great apes, the zoos have much, much numbers, a more systematic survey is required for the validation of this claim. And we have potential mechanisms we and others are working on for this. But in fact, uh, <clears throat> as I said, these differences are actually well known to the veterinary pathologist. And recent times, uh, um, They've, they've gone back and done really more systematic surveys than we've done, and these are two recent reviews from uh, well-known veterinary pathologists and, uh, and uh, veterinarians, and they come to the same general conclusions that we come to. So, comparative medicine of humans and great apes. What do we know for certain? What are we reasonably sure about? Most reliable information arises from careful studies in captivity, but neural signif numerical significance is limited to chimpanzees. Of course, there are distinctly human conditions related to upright posture that I've not mentioned, such as difficult childbirth, spine and back problems, and other an anatomic features of humans, where unusual skin, sinuses, breasts, airway, anatomy, and so on, that result in certain diseases, which I have not gone into. Some major infectious diseases, common ones, appear unique to humans. We humans appear to have hyperactive immune responses by various criteria. This heart attack of the human type appears to be much more common in humans. Some great ape diseases relate to their own unique anatomy, for example, the air sacs that they have. Unlike most African primates, this is for the aficionados, the human lineage eliminated endemic infectious retroviruses. How did that come about? What do we think we know? What are we not sure about? To what extent are these disease differences related to aging and lifespan? What extent are they related to prolonged post-reproductive lifespan that you hear about? Are we really at greater risk of developing common cancers? Are we more prone to autoimmune diseases? Do we react more to chronic viral infections resulting more commonly in AIDS? A series of human female reproductive conditions not reported in great apes to date common in, in apes in, in humans and that are listed there, which I won't read. Pathology and progression of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease appear more advanced in humans. How do we proceed? We need more mechanistic explanations on both sides of the coin. Are there great ape equivalents of human psychiatric diseases? We'll hear about that hopefully shortly. Can study of ancient hominin DNA that was mentioned uh, tell us about the emergence of unusual human diseases, also by distinctive genomic signatures in the, in the hominin genomes? Can we search this microbial contamination as been mentioned? Are the diseases similarities more prominent in great apes? So disease profiles of human and chimpanzees are rather different. Understanding the differences and implications of anthropogeny. 
Chimpanzees are poor models of human diseases. Humans are likely to be poor models of many chimpanzee diseases. And there are serious ethical issues. Pascal Ganyo, Jim Moore, and I wrote in 2005 that we should be allowed to conduct research on great apes following principles as similar as possible to those accepted for human research. And we suggested that the human researchers should volunteer to be subjects in the same studies. But the pendulum has now gone full, full swing to the other extreme. NIH has ended all support for research on chimpanzee diseases. And the question is, will the ban on chimpanzee research actually do more harm than good? And so we've gone from being highly inappropriate to almost impossible to do what would be done in humans. Can we find ethically acceptable compromises? Can this aid conservation of apes in the wild and care and captivity? So the final corollary is that chimpanzees would benefit from more ethical studies of their own diseases. And so <clears throat> I think that's a good point at which to end to acknowledge the great debt that we all owe to chimpanzees for what they've taught us about our diseases and not much about their own diseases. Thank you. <laughs>